Welcome to Canadian Innovators, the show that celebrates innovation, entrepreneurs, and the Canadian spirit. I'm Vess Sobot, sitting in for Jocelyn Bamford. Every week, we introduce a thought leader, tell their story, unpack the challenges of doing their craft, and explore ideas for job growth and prosperity. This week, we have a chair of the Badham Innovation Council with us, Bob Willis. He works for uh, Bradham Energies, a cutting-edge Canadian renewable company that converts waste to energy without incineration, toxic emissions, or waste to landfills with a unique patented Canadian process. Bob is a biochemist by training and has a deep understanding of materials, the waste stream, and how to create energy from it. Bob, thank you so much for joining us today from your Milton office. You're very welcome. Uh, Bob, share, share with the audience uh, the history of Bradman Energies. Uh, it seems that you have a uh, solution uh, that uh, municipalities are looking for. You can convert wastes, including food waste, plastic waste, and agricultural wastes into energy. That seems to me like the holy grail of solving very many problems, not just in Canada, but around the world. Tell the audience a little bit about that. Okay, I'd be pleased to do that. Uh, Bradham Energy is a privately held corporation, and they have developed a process that's called Carbon Energy Recovery, or CER. And what the process does is it, it produces renewable natural gas, or most people call it RNG these days, uh, from carbon-based waste materials. And as you pointed out, without incineration or without burning the waste. Uh, there and there, it's very important to note that there are no waste products left over from the process. Everything is a product that's sold. Uh, the main, the main product being RNG. Um, so you don't burn anything. Uh, how do you no. do? It? Do you do it with steam? Yes, the the the, the process uh, uses a a a what's called a steam reforming process. It's a commercially available process. That's the other important point. Is there's really no new technologies per se in this process. It's, it's combining existing commercial technologies that are widely used and have been used for many years uh, for, for a variety of purposes. And it's, it's tailoring them to, so they work together to produce renewable natural gas from waste without burning it. So the, the first step in the process obviously is getting the waste feedstocks ready for the process and and this uses commercially available common uh, waste well, operation materials that, that are processes that shred the waste uh, into small pieces essentially uh the the waste is then oh and and the other important part about this is in the preparation of the waste the the cer process requires approximately 30% moisture in the waste when it goes into the process. So the preparation also adjusts the moisture content, either drying the waste or, in some cases, adding water to the waste to get the moisture up to 30%. And what's the uh, natural content of water in waste? Is it higher than 30%? It, it depends on what you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about plastics, there's virtually no water, so we have to add water. And we'll get to that in a minute, but because we process them as mixtures. But uh, food waste, for example, comes in at 70, 75, or sometimes 80%. You could imagine a watermelon. <laughs> uh, right. That's the type of, of moisture that's in it. So we have to dry them. And, and that water that's collected from drying the, the, the waste is then run through an on site water treatment process that treats the water, it either treats the water to uh, commercial. Uh, surface water criteria in Ontario, for example, or if we're near our, our, our sewer system, the, the we'll process water from the food or the waste uh, feedstock is put into the, the sewer system. Uh, anyway, the so the other important point about the preparation of the waste is that we have to get rid of all of the air that's in the waste. We call it free oxygen, because the the CR process is anaerobic. It, it doesn't have any oxygen present. You can't have oxygen present in there. Uh, 
Otherwise, at the temperature that are involved, you'll end up with combustion. So gotcha. we, we, we inhibit the combustion by making it anaerobic. Let's hold that thought. I love your company's yeah. slogan. The future is clean. The solution is clean, clear. Yep. Let's talk about that when we come back from break. Your company's slogan, I was mentioning before the break, the future is clean, the solution is clear. We're back with Bob Willis of Bradham Energies, and he takes waste from landfills and he converts it into natural gas and a whole host of other products. Um, Bob, Bob, let's pick it up from there. Great slogan, uh, and explain to the audience how that's true. Well, the... the, the... The process uh, where we left it off, we had the feedstock ready to go into the process. The next two steps are producing what's called syngas, which breaks the feed down, reforms the feedstock into its natural products, carbon hydrogen, uh, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen primarily. We then have a, a microbial system and a bioreactor that converts that into renewable natural gas. So during the cleanup process, the metals. The residual from the from the uh, from the steam reformer, for example, is aggregate that's used in making asphalt, and uh, it's also good for brick sand. the The metals that are naturally present in the feedstocks are recovered and are recycled, and and we produce a lot of nice clean water from the bioreactor. So those are the main products. Oh, and uh, one other one that's really important is ammonia, because most of these feedstocks have ammonia. And that's converted into ammonium sulfate fertilizer. So we end up converting all of the components uh, that are in the feedstock into some type of saleable product that's sold to third parties. That uh, That's very promising. I understand that Bradham is going to build a commercial plant in Ontario to process about 100,000 tons of food waste per year. And uh, that can provide about... Uh, 28,000 homes with uh, renewable natural gas. Tell us more about that. Yes, uh, we, we have, uh, for those that now understand the technical ready, readiness level, the processes are about a TLR8. So it's, it's ready for commercial application. And our first product will be in Ontario and it will process uh, about 100,000 tons per year of, of, of uh, food waste from the food waste, by the way, is from all commercial operations, restaurants, uh, institutions, uh, uh, supermarkets, for example. Uh, and that that waste is per, per, will produce about 2.5 million gigajoules or about, uh, I can't remember the number, it's 65 million or something like that, cubic meters of natural gas, which is enough natural gas for about uh, 27 or 28,000 residences. Uh, from one one facility. Is it ideal to situate the plant very close to a landfill? Uh, the plant, it, it, it is because that, that, that has the transport system and everything all set up. But what we, what we actually do is we put the sites in transfer stations where, oh. where, where the waste are, are, are naturally taken to the place, to the transfer station anyway. And so we don't have to have any separate transportation system or anything that, that it uses the the transfer station uh, that is all usually already approved by the by the regulator for receiving the waste. Oh, interesting. Um, um, for example, when you pick up plastic waste, do you have to sort sort them? Do they have to be no, clean? No, the 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 system actually prefers mixed waste. Uh, uh, the the the. the and and it doesn't require that the waste be clean, which is we can take municipal waste, for example, as it comes off the garbage truck. Where there's no need to purify or clean or sort or anything, uh, other than taking out the batteries and the and the metals, which uh, which the preparation system does. Uh, we we can put those through the process, but they don't contain any energy, so it just reduces the efficiency of the process. So we separate those out first, and then the rest of it goes into the into the process. Uh, as it's received, and then, in fact, we use uh, wood waste as a supplemental feedstock to buffer the system, so that if there's a failure in delivery of, of, of feedstock, uh, we can use on-site wood waste uh, 
uh, in the process, and, and we can, in some cases, mix that with the feedstock to get the, so you don't have to uh, get such a fine adjustment in the moisture content. It sounds like the system is very flexible then, uh, and very, I think that's yes. probably something that municipalities will uh, will uh, welcome with open arms. Tell me, uh, when do you think your uh, plant will be operational? The, the, the plan at the present time, we're, we're all ready to go. We have financing all secured, and, and we've got part of our regulatory approval process. We're going to finish that off, and then the plan is to have the plant operate, operated probably early 2025, uh, assuming there's no delays in getting materials and Terrific. that kind of thing. Terrific. A lot about when we start. We're back with Bob Willis of Bradham Energies talking about energy from waste. You're very passionate about the uh, potential for your patented technologies. Can you make other products other than renewable natural gas? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, renewable natural gas is the prime product we're going to be producing from the first plant. Uh, that's part of the reason for the Innovation Center is to develop other pro energy products. and. Uh, we we have a list that we're 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 working on. the f the first The first is methanol to produce biomethanol. Um, methanol is becoming it, it already is, but it's becoming more of a, a, a important fuel, particularly for marine transport systems. They're they're changing to methanol engines, for example, in their in their in their cargo vessels. Uh, so <clears throat> we produce biomethanol. There's two ways of doing that. One is uh, you can use commercially available uh, systems to take the RNG that we produce and convert that into methanol, biomethanol in this case. Uh, that's a, that's a, the, the, the existing processes for producing methanol from natural gas are, are fairly energy intensive. And we're trying to look at another way of doing it, and that's to convert our microbes that are in the bioreactors to produce methanol instead of natural gas. And so the innovation center is under under in progress of looking at how to do that, and if we can do that, then we can tremendously reduce the cost of the biomethanol that's being produced from the system. So that's one product. Uh, the second product that we're focusing on is a, 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 a type of jet A fuel for aircraft. Uh, the the microbes can be modified, and we know this is the case, can be modified to produce. A product that then ends up being uh, in a product called limonene, and limonene is a it, it actually is the odor that you get from oranges and lemons and that kind of thing, but it's a major component in 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 jet fuel from fossil carbon sources, and so we believe we can get the bioreactor to produce uh, limonene that can then use be used for jet fuel, so that's another one. And and the last one that we're looking at right at the present time is is ethylene to produce a bioethylene, and ethylene is a major starting project uh, product that you'll know this very well for making plastics and other kinds of uh, of, of uh, synthetic chemicals that are used for a whole range of other things, and if we can get a source of biomethanol bioethanol that's used made from non-fossil carbon sources, it changes the carbon footprint of those industries tremendously. So oh, those are three totally changes the game. Looking. Yeah. It totally yeah. Gain, changes the game. It seems that there's endless opportunities for your technologies. Uh, and all communities have waste resources that uh, they want to reduce. Uh, so but, uh, uh, I, I can't imagine uh, that um, uh, any municipality wouldn't want to uh, try a technology that's uh, that's proven right um what uh, what other things can you do with uh the waste products that you have well the the, the you mean the byproducts that yeah that, that come yeah. off yes the, yeah. the byproduct well the, the the aggregate is a very interesting one uh it it, it it's tested to meet aggregate cri or criteria for Ontario, so it's 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 an aggregate product. Uh, it we already have uh, high interest and 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 contracts ready to be signed with users of that material to make asphalt. Um, 
we produce uh, the, the the process that's processing a thousand tons a year produces about uh, forty thousand tons of, of aggregate per year. So it, it's a significant amount. Uh, the other main one of the main products we have is are the metals. Uh, the, 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 there's even particularly on municipal waste and in some of the products we're looking at uh, for that for example if we're processing coal tailings coal mine tailings they have a high concentration of uh, of rare metal earths that are important in the electronics industry right now so we can isolate those from the from the metals that we collect uh, what provinces uh, like Nova Scotia, who have lots of coal tailings uh, uh, in big piles yes. there, would certainly be very interested in something like that. Yes, they're very interested, and, and it, it, it reduces their footprint for electricity. They, they, they are, they are, we are actually looking at a project with them to process their coal mine tailings into either renewable natural gas or into biomethanol, and they'll use that in their turbines to produce electricity instead of coal. Uh, fired plants or or using uh, fuel oil. So it changes our carbon footprint very significantly. We're back with Bob Willis, chair of the Innovation Council at Bradham Energies. This is the part of the show where we ask our guest, if you're prime minister for a day, what would you do to unleash Canada's birthright? What would you do that would be a game changer for your industry and for Canadians at large? Bob, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I want the job anyway, but it, this, <laughs> the, the, thing, the things I would uh, emphasize are, first of all, is the, is the regulatory approval process. Um, it, we we want to make sure these processes are properly regulatory approved and they don't cause any harm to the environment or human health. So that's a given. So there's no reason to short circuit any of that. It's a matter of setting priorities. And I, I know the regulators are extremely busy and they have a stack of approvals that they're looking at uh, and, and evaluating. But what's needed is some way of prioritizing how these are put through the process so that... Uh, in my view, anyway, any any project that's this innovative in the renewable energy or waste management area should be given priority because we have a very significant waste problem, and uh, this this should be given priority over something, for example, like building a highway. And so, if there was some way that the processes for regulatory approval could be prioritized so that so that we come in on the regulatory approval for a renewable energy project at the top of the pile instead of going at the bottom of the pile. And I know from discussing this with regulators that that can improve the time in your regulatory approval by eight or nine months or maybe even a year. It could be a and, game changer. And that's very significant. It's a game changer, exactly. We so, hear that uh, a lot on Canadian innovators, that regulations are very important and any way of fast-tracking them uh, would right. be uh, welcome. Yeah, it's very important, though you don't want to short circuit what the regular what the approval process does, because sure. it's very important that we protect the environment and human health. And we've gotten into some disastrous situations historically for not doing that properly. So we don't want that to happen again. But it does remind me of an example where you know sometimes it takes twenty four months to getting a building approval here in Canada. Meanwhile, the city of Phoenix has just come up with a program where you get a building permit in twenty four hours. That might be too drastic, right. but there are ways of speeding up the process. I, I take your point, absolutely. What's point number two? Right. Well, number two uh, is, um, so I'm going to check my notes. I don't want to get into something that I didn't want to do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, 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 the second point is, we, we need to encourage uh, uh, processes that reduce carbon emissions, particularly fossil carbon emissions. And, and the, the, there needs to be a way of doing that, that that gives these projects priority. And one of the, one of the things that would help tremendously is, uh, is uh, uh,
putting proper uh, systems together so that these these projects go forward and become part of the it's what called the the circular economy. And so that's a very very important thing. And I know governments are trying to do that, but I think there's more emphasis needed on 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 fitting these projects into the circular economy. Uh, and and the third one is is uh, some simplified ma ma method of providing economic assistance for these projects. Uh, anybody who's who's tried to get a federal or a provincial grant, uh, which you have to end up usually paying back in some form uh, anyway, knows that the process is onerous. Uh, first of all, you have to go through the grant application procedure, which takes tremendous time and effort and a lot of discussion and process. Uh, it, it takes a lot of expertise to do that. And then secondly, once you get the grant, then you have the high, high requirement for reporting uh, progress and everything as a, pro as a project goes forward. And our investors tell us that we have to hire probably uh, at least a dozen people to look after that aspect of the project. So a simplified way of doing uh, providing assistance is through tax credits. The, the 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 tax income tax system already exists. You can just add a clause to clause to that, and the people to do this work in the government already exists. So you could do it by putting a uh, approved tax credit. And and governments are doing this. The, the new regulations for tax credits for hydrogen, for example, in Canada, that's exactly what they're doing. And I think that's a a, a very valuable approach.